smartest creature on the planet. One creature thinks he's the smartest because he put a man on the moon. Okay, so some think that rocket scientists are the smartest. Actually, I'm going to blow you away with some new information. There is someone who is much smarter. In fact, rocket scientists look up to this group because they have gone way past putting a man on the moon. They built seven colonies in our solar system. I know what you're thinking. They're aliens, right? No, they're not aliens. They're native to the Earth. And I'm going to show you a photo of them. Meet Lacerda Beliniata. This is a reptile of the family Lacerda and genus Beliniata. This guy hasn't been to the moon, but his lineage became the most intelligent creature on Earth, and they now have spaceships and their kind living on planets and moons in this solar system. Two guys in Sweden met one of them, a female named Shrashk, something like that. <laughs> I'm not pronouncing that correctly, so she just wants us to call her Lacerda, the family name of her reptile species. I thought she just picked the name out of the air. Then I discovered that her name is a class of lizards, and there's also a family called Lacertidae. Here are some others in that family. This is Lacerda agilis. And this is Lacerda viridis. And here's Lacerda, the intelligent lizard, which has established seven colonies on moons and planets in this solar system. She does not allow herself to be photographed, so these young men had to sketch her image with pencil and paper. Seven colonies on moons and planets in this solar system. I think that's an amazing achievement for a lizard. But it took them 65 million years to achieve it. These two Swedish men recorded their conversation with her, asking many questions. And they took the time to write it down for us so that we could also benefit from their serendipity. I read those questions and answers and made videos so you can enjoy the entertaining exchange between them. You can watch the videos on this YouTube channel, and you're welcome to copy them and put them on your own channel if you care. The series is called Lacerda File 1 and Lacerda File 2, and there are several parts to each. I don't know what happened to the two Swedish guys. She might have eaten them. She is carnivorous, but likes her meat cooked, and she enjoys apples and oranges, too. I'd love to see her tongue. Thanks for watching. Okay, we just found this out here in the middle of the lake. So foggy. Okay, touch it. Oh, did you see it? Slimy? Yeah! <laughs> Stick or something. So, what the fuck is it? <laughs> touch it. Gross. Gross. <laughs> oh, weird.
if it's like a disease. This man. Get a close up on him. I know, dude. I just, I just wanted to share this, and it, issue one, and and there's a bunch of these manuals for the rep, for these reps, um, a hundred and something here. Let me, let me look completely here. We've got 198 manuals, okay, one through 198. Here's just some of the titles: Paranoia, the 198th manual, Paranoia. The Starting Point, Reptilians, Part 199. Do unto others, but not unto me, Reptilians, Part 198. Blaming Choice for Who I Am. Tired Eyes. <laughs> the Tapestry of Your Life, Reptilians. Drooping Eyelids and Resonant Possession. Okay, projection possessions, resonant energy possessions, exploring the negativity of ourselves, part two, exploring the negativity of ourselves, part one. How do I stop feeling this way? Why do I keep feeling this way? How to live words, part one. How to live words, part two. From mind words to living words, the nature of words, the human mind as a computer. You think you're living? Question mark. Living in the world of our own, part one and two. Assessing your full potential, part one and two. Waiting for change to come to me, reptilian support, part 176. What does it mean to stand up, reptilian support? You know, fair play principles in our daily relationships. Sibling rivalry and fairness. <laughs> I'm starting to crack up here in a minute. Uh... Acing job interviews, reptilians and memories, part one, two, three, and four, actually, that. Self-interest and self-honesty, how does that work? <laughs> uh, Decision-making, it, it starts, and here's like Anu on honesty versus self-honesty, deliberately sabotaging my own change. Put a guard in front of your mind. It's a time to change. Anu, self-honesty, and this is in the hundreds now. Let's go back to the beginning here. You got 37, am I real? Facing the question of who I am. Why do relationships exist? Where does relationships come from? The future of consequence, giving up knowledge, giving up knowledge for life. Uh, the split between two worlds. My fear of loneliness or aloneness. Uh, here's the reptilians, a visitor. Be still and know I am God. Breathe the answer to life. Relationships as illusion of control. The human picture. Engineering God. Either life or death. Where is life? I mean, these are the different titles that I'm reading on. A new confirms the Jesus message. The obvious secret, reality or illusion. Test your enlightenment. Reverse your self-awareness. That's part 16. The death and rebirth of self, part 12. The promise of eternal life, part 13. Part 6, how I veiled the Atlanteans. Sex and relationships in existence. The young, inquisitive Anu. Am I God? The road ahead. The quantum time illusion. Okay. Uh, you get it. Yeah, and um, published April 28th, 2013, this 187 series. Now, now, I don't know if they released all these series like it at one time. Um, who wrote all these series? 
uh, you can do your own investigations if you're if you're super interested in you see the symbolism involved here in the, their little graphic their terrible little graphic here <laughs> I say terrible one. Full of mysteries from Bigfoot to ghost stories and of course the disappearance of D.B. Cooper. Another mystery buried deep in the hills of eastern Washington keeps resurfacing. A bottomless pit said to be a pathway to the paranormal. Como Forest Denise Whitaker heads east in search but of the hole. Some believe hole. what lies beneath is a deep dark hole with supernatural powers. One of the only people alive ever known to have seen this mysterious hole took me as far as he could or would. Oh, honey, don't go up that damn driveway. I want to see if there's tracks up here. I'm just curious. You're out of your tree going up there. Red Elk, a Native American shaman or medicine man, tells me his dad first showed him the hole in 1961. He says, this is an endless hole. He says he's been back many times and that strange things happen every time he goes near it. And people get it confused with what I call the devil's hole. Many locals claim to know about the hole, but it didn't really become a phenomenon until 1997 when Mel Waters went on the Coast to Coast radio show with Art Bell. I, as usual, I brought the dogs with me. Uh, they wouldn't go anywhere near the damn thing. Waters said the hole had a three-foot stone wall around it. It seemed bottomless to him, so he used an old shark fisherman's trick, sending thousands of feet of fishing line down. What I did is I sent down a roll of lifesavers. Uh -huh. Lifesavers? Yeah, so when it hits the water, the, the lifesavers will dissolve. But the lifesavers came back up whole, no water. So how deep was this hole? Waters said he believed it descended miles into the earth, and he says he's heard strange stories about its powers. The one guy claims that he threw his uh, departed canine down into the hole. He swear the dog actually came back to him. When Mel went public, that's when the trouble began. But why? Now I'm going public on this. Red Elk claims the government has a secret base there. It's an underground base, a very small underground base. That's how Red Elk explains white boxes covering the area on some satellite images. Is the government covering something up? Red Elk says he's also witnessed alien activity at the hole. A huge spacecraft, one will appear and, and hover over the hole. That, he says, happens during summer solstice. They unload and then they load, and then they take off. God help the things that they load. 
alien spacecraft, dogs that come back to life? I went to the Northwest Museum of Legends and Lore seeking some answers. Well, I believe there is a hole. But Philip Lipson's never seen the hole, even though he's led expeditions to find it. Well, I think it's an actually a true, a true event, just something that's never really been totally uncovered. And to this day, no one's been able to find it since that famous radio conversation. It was mildly sensational, and then it just mushroomed, completely out of control. Allensburg Public Library historian Milton Waggy says the phone rang off the hook with all kinds of stories about the hole, some explainable, some not. He's still trying to solve the mystery of what happened to the library's file on Mel's hole. Well, it just disappeared, which lends itself to the mysteriousness of Mel's hole. You know, did Mel take it? Did it just sort of you know, rise out of the locked file cabinet? You never know. You know, there might be a hole out there. The question is, can any of us find it? And um, a lot of religious proofs as well, among others the word Messiah, Musha, which means crocodile and the lizard king. And apparently there are quite a few people in various religions around the globe who wait for the return of the Messiah or lizard, lizard king. species on the planet which is uh, the reptiles and there's times when it's the only thing that makes sense to me uh, when the bushes are in power and they voluntarily murder a hundred to three hundred thousand people before the war started I mean with their sanctions and everything and they know that they're doing it they know that that's going on and, and they're doing it seemingly for weapons of mild destruction mm -hmm, yeah really sure uh, for a black goo uh, for control of a black goo and more money. And it looks like the powers that be don't really care about the planet. It's a species dying and it's mainly from pollution and they keep ma making these polluting products and they know, they must know, because I know, there are products that don't pollute nearly as much as theirs do. Uh, they're renewable fuels, reusable fuels, but um, these people in charge, and I use the word people loosely, uh, seem to think that nuclear energy is a good way to make energy and uh, fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels, when there are known ways to do it otherwise. Uh, George Carlin, I watched the other day, well not, I mean it was a YouTube, but that's the neat thing about YouTube, even people are dead you can watch, um, called them our owners. He said your owners don't want you to do this and your owners don't want you to do that. And I think that the owners of the planet don't really give a shit about the the planet. They don't care how they destroy it, what they do to it. Uh, so I say that the, you hear the helicopters running in and out of the valley. As the reptiles come in, our owners are here, I think. Maybe I'm a little bit short-sighted, but that may go with the rest of my life, looking into the valley and hearing my owners drive in and out. Uh, but uh, I don't have another explanation for it, as I said. Uh, why these people meet and see how they can uproot the rest of the economic policies when there's enough money, enough food, enough energy for everybody on the planet. Uh, what has to be discussed? I don't know. How to make them more money? That really would seem ludicrous to me. But nothing makes sense to me. For all your people who believe in reptilians, lizards, and serpent people, historically I can tell you this, that the word Messiah literally means the lizard king in Demotic or Pharaonic. And apparently there are quite a few people in various religions around the globe who wait for the return of the Messiah or lizard, lizard king. And um, a lot of religious proofs as well, among others the word Messiah, Musha, which means crocodile and the lizard king. So as a historian I cannot tell you if the, uh, the reptilian theory is um, correct or not, but um, historically I guess I can live with it because the enemy within 
is very very real and they're not like us so here we can see on his head the uh, the thing for the circumcision again there you see so apparently the circumcision thing has to do with the uh, with reptilians or in this case uh, Sobek of whom I will tell you more in a minute the word Christ is Greek and means exactly the same thing as Messiah in Hebrew namely the anointed one as it was an old Hebrew tradition to massage the feet of their kings with oil anointing the ancient Egyptians of whom all monotheistic religions come from had the pharaohs also massaged with oil namely crocodile oil extracted from crocodile fat you see the snake there and you see how long their hands are that's real pharaonic that's one of the things by which you can recognize them oh, watch Obama's hands they're just like Obama's hands these are like the hands of Obaton Ama And guess what the pharaonic or demotic word for crocodile is? Musha, M S S H, as in demotic, just as in Hebrew or Arabic, only the consonants are being written. And Musha almost sounds like a snake hissing, referring to the crocodile god of the pharaohs, Sobek who once came out of the water and created the world and as we know a croc is a big reptile or lizard and here we can see Sobek together with Hathor so within this ancient serpent religion the pharaohs await the coming of their god and creator the Musha or Messiah as they force their serpent religion upon humanity through torture by force and by the violent priests of Amun who introduced to us a statue of man nailed on a cross meaning that he's not allowed to defend himself because he's got his hands nailed that he can't run away because his legs are nailed we can even see the pharaonic sun hieroglyph see the pharaoh show even the word Kaaba is pharaonic go and have a look there it is it's pharaonic the sun hieroglyph and in the holy city of Mecca Paris Hilton has uh, three handbag shops in Mecca in Mecca where the Jamarat has already been destroyed and the Hajj has been made invalid after 2004 so we can see her small eyes and the very physically big mouth which are very typical pharaonic uh, features so Mrs. Pharaoh in Mecca where she's being protected by the all-seeing eye of the Saudi police and the Saudi pharaohs it's all pharaonic guys and they don't want the Muslim to stone the obelisk so that's why they blew it up in 2004 I can tell you one thing your religion is gone it's finished and the pharaohs as Mrs. Hilton here are definitely heading for a one world religion altogether as Mr. Hitler already said, one people, one Führer, one religion, etc. One people. The Freemasons called the Mshha or Lizard King Adonai, which is a Hebrew word meaning Sir or Mister, and where the word Don, as in Don Quixote, derives from. So here we can see the uh, the Templar symbol here 
look there it is as we can see on all the uh, on all the tanks it's the uh, of, of the NATO you know in, in Iraq and the Israeli army has it as well upside down next to Horus so this is the symbol of um, the statue of Horus yeah well and the Masons they came out of the Templars and found in Switzerland their base there's no doubt that we are not from this planet because we are not adapted to it at all we have to put on clothes otherwise we're cold we must cook and boil everything otherwise we can't digest it and we must put on shoes and socks on for not hurting our soft extraterrestrial feet and there's no evolution either otherwise we would have furs and claws no we're not from here our creators have most probably been conquered by the ones who fight others from the inside by infiltration who have Octagon, Switzerland as their base and who await Messiah, Mesha, the Lizard King. As a historian I don't know if the lizards are here. The enemy within though is very real and there are a lot of historical proofs that the lizards are there and um, a lot of religious proofs as well among others the word Messiah, Mesha which means crocodile and the lizard king and um, a lot of religious proofs as well among others the word messiah Mesha, which means crocodile and the lizard king about 12 miles west of Ellensburg, Washington, it was reportedly a place where townsfolk would dump unwanted old appliances, furniture, or anything else they wanted to get rid of, and this had apparently been going on for decades. Yet in all that time, it never filled up. One story has it that a cow fell into the hole and could be heard mooing until its calls faded into oblivion. Another story has it that a, a local fellow disposed of his beloved dog in Mel's hole after it passed away, but the very next day was reunited with it alive and well, seemingly uh, appearing from nowhere and apparently unharmed. It is said to be a magical place where black beams of energy can occasionally be seen shooting up from its gaping mouth. As for the expedition itself, it was made up of a mixed lot. The leader of the group was Charlotte Lefebvre, who is the co-director of the Seattle Museum of the Mysteries, a museum specializing in paranormal science, which is another way of saying pseudoscience which is another way of saying not scientific. Their guide was a Native American shaman called Red Elk. He is an inner circle member of the Hyoka Society, a keeper of the caves and the underworld, a member of the Red Web Society, an honorary member of the Cherokee Nation's Twisted Hair Society, and he is also known as Gerald Osborne of Ellensburg, Washington. His claim to fame is his reported contact with the reptilians who live underground and his wearing of a hunk of metal that he says came from an alien spaceship. Another claim to fame is his having been taken to Mel's Hole in 1961 by his father and subsequent visits thereafter. One other notable member of the party was Pat Pringle, a geologist with the State Department of Natural Resources, who went along just in case there was actually something out there of geological interest. There wasn't, and although the search for Mel's Hole had been an ongoing project for some seven years prior, and included the involvement of Red Elk, their Indian guide, nothing was ever found. 
The whole affair ended up as nothing more than a camping trip, with Red Elk telling stories about lizard people kidnapping women and taking them back underground to mate with. But what would cause 30 people to head out like this with anticipation of finding a local myth like Mel's Hole? To begin to understand this, we need to go back to the original telling of the popular story. That happened in February of 1997 on the Coast to Coast AM radio show with none other than 12 miles west of Ellensburg, Washington. It was reportedly a place where townsfolk would dump unwanted old appliances, furniture, or anything else they wanted to get rid of, and this had apparently been going on for decades. Art's guest that night was Mel Waters, namesake for Mel's Hole, who came on to spin the tall tale of this deep topic. The hole, he claimed, was located on his property that he owned and was in fact deeper than anyone could determine. He recounted stories of local residents who knew about the hole and had been there many times, all amazed at the wonder of it all and the paranormal aspects to it. On the show, Mel told how he was determined to find out how deep this thing really was and how he set out to do just that. Buying fishing line and large 5,000-yard spools, he tied a one-pound weight on the end and began lowering the line down the hole. Going through spool after spool of fishing line, he managed to reach an 80,000-foot depth. That's a tad over 15 miles deep, and still he hadn't hit bottom. Some years later, his stories were confirmed and added to, again on the Coast to Coast radio show, this time by none other than Red Elk himself, who, as far as I can figure, is nothing more than an average American white dude of European heritage who has a flair for the dramatic. And so, with the confirmation of Red Elk, the myth grew and grew until expeditions were launched in an attempt to find Mel's Hole. There have been others from town who have offered up locations for this mythical hole. Hell, I can too, as far as that goes. It's right here. Twelve miles out, just over a bridge before the Manastash Road turns into dirt. But as it turns out, the hole is as hard to find as Mel himself. You see, the only time anyone had ever heard from Mel Waters is the one guest appearance on Art Bell's show. He never called again. Locals, who had been questioned by reporters, reported never meeting or knowing him. The county assessor's office reports that there was no listing of any property ever owned by a Mel Waters. In 1997, the Tri-City Herald reported that Waters was not listed in the county telephone directory or the register of taxpayers, and that authorities in Ellingsburg were unable to find any evidence that he was a resident, thus calling into question whether he even existed. But if you are a believer in this, you can always find those in town who are willing to spin the tale for you and even make up some things if they think you'll bite on the story. They more than likely laugh about it later over a few beers. As far as the fishing line story is concerned, if you bother to do the math, you would find that regardless of the test weight of the line, the total 80,000 feet of it would be enough to cause it to snap under its own weight. Also, according to our friendly neighborhood geologist Pat Pringle, the temperature at 80,000 feet down would exceed 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, more than enough to melt any fishing line. But all of this factual information was available since long before the expedition in 2002, with the only exception to reason coming from a medicine man wannabe French-Irish dude by the name of Gerald Osborne from Ellensburg. There had been some suspicious emails sent to Art Bell and George Norrie from someone claiming to be Mel. The emails told of government involvement, bribery, Mel's forced immigration to Australia, and kidnapping. But none of these could ever be confirmed to be anything but fantasy. Red Elk appeared on Coast to Coast several times after the original story. His own telling of the tale had evolved to include a large structure being built over the hole by our secret government and used to load and unload cargo into the underworld from reptilian spaceships. 
You know, it takes a certain kind of gullibility to believe those of questionable character to the point of promoting these whacked-out notions, as with Charlotte Lefebvre, who helped build the monuments such as the Seattle Museum of the Mysteries, being eveiled as some church to the paranormal world of ghosts, unicorns, and fairy dust. No amount of logic or reason could stop her and her followers from traipsing off into the wilderness for some hand-holding kumbaya moment that means so much for the lost. And it makes guys like me wonder at just how little it takes for all of this to happen, and it confounds me how delusional some people can get, even when those in the same ilk, like Art Bell, can find suspicion in it. Didn't these people listen to the show? Where were they when Art Bell asked Mel Waters? It's really wonderful water. For Mel, Mel, you wouldn't be pulling my leg. This is Super Soylent, and thank you for watching. my time here but did you ever go hunting for that Mel's hole remember that story oh that yes uh, the one that got me with Mr. Bell in first place yeah, all right did uh, you uh, what happened about that well I was, <laughs> um it's there I've been called all kinds of liar and stuff like that it's uh, it's covered by an outbuilding uh and uh, uh anybody crazy enough to to go on that piece of land uh, they're out of their tree you know i it's uh, it's got uh openness up and uh big ships come down and unload and load and uh, uh they keep that secret and with good reason otherwise a damn government will have that too but uh, uh Nevertheless, yes, it's there, and uh, I I ran into all kinds of trouble with it. I've been followed by helicopter, and uh, um, they use it to bring stuff in down into their lower cavern living areas. And uh, unfortunately, what they unload or you know take out of the hole are sacred to them, sacred bones. They murder people and do certain things with it and grind it and put it in white gold and it's for longevity. And, um, gosh, it, it's, uh, I 
took another medicine man with me over there, and uh, it just it just scared the daylight out of me. They had murdered a, a redheaded woman from Kizikwa, I think. And these are actual-looking lizard people. Yeah, they're people, and and so bears in that sense. Uh, there, there are brothers and sisters. You know, we're not alone in this world no. of, of, of planetary systems but, or anything. But they're violent, I guess? Oh, yeah. They think they're God. If there's a God, they don't believe in it. And uh, if there's a God, they're it. If there's a devil, they're it. They can do anything they want. And uh, I've had my run-ins with them. And, uh, but they're very, very real. I, I told before uh, getting a letter, it's, it's sitting there at my desk at home. I ran across it just last week and pulled it out. Uh, a lady in New York or New Jersey has a kid. She and her little brother and a bunch of friends snuck into an abandoned building and were playing down in the basement amongst the pipes, and they heard a noise and stuff and uh, um, turned around, and there was a lizard child. Oh. And they all took off. She literally said right out, I'm ashamed to admit it, I pulled my brother out of the, going out the window and went over the top of him, and I peed my pants. Oh, God. Red Elk, do they look human at all? I mean, do they oh, have no, any, no, no. no human features at all? Well, eyes, legs. Eyes, legs. You, they you walk know, on tail top. and dragon, and uh, uh, they've got, uh, their skin is uh, basically scaly. Uh, they look like an upright walking lizard. and uh, um, Are they green, or what? What's well, they, they've got a mottled green... Uh, um, khaki and okay. color combination and uh, um, some are you know none of them are really tall maybe 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 six two at the very tallest but generally our size you know five five seven five nine do they look like you know snake heads or what well they got a lizard face they do have a lizard face oh yeah right. yeah and uh, but they're people you know, it, uh, I, I look at uh, as I call you brother and sister. I call them brother and sister. Even as the, as violent as they might be. Well, well, certainly they are very violent. Uh, but I'm not afraid of them, so that makes them afraid of me. Uh, you wouldn't introduce them to your friends, though. I take it, would you? I have. That timber <laughs> stands between seven and eight feet tall, and as expected, has the look of a reptile. They too are erect, standing bipeds. The head is slightly conical in shape and has two bony ridges riding from the brow across a back sloping skull. There appears to be no bridge between the eyes. The nasal openings are at the end of a small flattened nose and are described as two small slits that slant upwards in a V formation. Small openings can be seen on the side of their heads but no ears as such. The eyes contain vertically slit pupils with a flame or an orange colored surround. They have wide lipless mouths which contain various types of teeth, including fangs. Some have thin fleshy spines under their chin. Their skin is scaled, usually greenish brown or light gray in color and hairless. The scales on their backs, thighs and upper arms are quite large, with hands, abdomen and face being covered with smaller scales, allowing more flexibility. Reptilians' bodies are lean and firm with powerful arms and legs, long arms and three fairly long fingers and an opposable thumb. The feet have three toes and one recessed fourth toe that is toward the back side of the ankle. Claws on the hands and feet are short and blunt. They do not have teeth on their upper torso and there is no navel. How do they behave? The ruling caste of indigenous reptilian consider themselves to be the genuine natives of the earth and humans to be squatters. A group of reptilians is known as a hive and the race is absolutely void of any care, concern or compassion for human beings. The worker caste can be friendly as long as they are allowed to speak first. They will answer if you address them, are very cautious beings and consider most humans to be hostile. They usually seem surprised when they find that most humans are open and trustworthy. The working caste is generally used for physical labor and they have a no-nonsense get-back-to-work attitude. They have a different attitude to time than humans. It is not as important to them in the way that it is to us. 
what do they eat? Meat, insects, and a large variety of plants, including vegetables and fruit. They prefer their meat raw and very fresh, but have learned to enjoy some cooked meats, like rare beef steak. Unlike the grains, they eat frequently and usually carry or send for food during their breaks. The ruling caste is very secretive about their food, preferring to eat in private. They enjoy much of the same food that humans do and are often seen secretly munching on a freshly found snail. Where do they come from? Earth. Yes, Earth. An ancient extraterrestrial race of reptilians inhabited the Earth many years before man. Would you invite one to meet your mother? You could possibly invite a worker caste home for tea only if you had established some trust first with it. This would involve being totally subservient and only speaking when spoken to. You would need to warn your mother of the guest's appearance in advance. That is, a seven foot tall lizard, and then ensure that she understood not to speak further. Hey guys, just a little reptile update. Um, dos palabras, una, dos que son una, un hombre, un hombre, un hombre, lo que soy, eso sí, hombre, hombre humano, pues, hombre humano, porque hay hay seres humanos que no tienen forma humana, pero no son. Yo soy un humano. Test, test. Hey, what's up, everybody? Um, I'm making this video for one one simple reason. Uh, this is this is uh, this video is a challenge, challenge to the entire uh, YouTube population. Uh, I challenge you to prove that I am not a reptilian, okay? Because I am 100% fucking reptilian. We are here. We have come to conquer and uh, prove that I'm not, okay? Uh, I will go on any talk show, any, uh, I'll Skype with anybody, um, uh, just to prove that uh, I am reptilian and I am here to conquer. Uh, I got my brothers, uh, my reptilian brothers, waiting in the wings to take over the presidency, Uh uh anyway uh i'll i'll go even one step further look at my uh unnaturally long tongue and weird eyes British coin when I was in uh, Calais some couple of weeks ago. And look here, uh, it's one penny. Here we can see the reptilian feet here. Now why do they put some reptilian foot on it, feet on it? And this here is a crocodile with some pharaonic feather on it, on his nose. Now why would they do this? And uh, well, if I look at the other side, well, this is the old crocodile.
the La Certifile One, translation by Christian Filer, introduction. I certify that the following text is the absolute truth and no work of fiction. These are parts of a transcript of an interview I've made with a non-human and reptilian being in December 1999. This female being was already in contact with a friend of mine whose name is given only with the abbreviation EF in the text since some months. Let me declare that I was all my life a skeptic about UFOs, aliens, and other weird things. And I thought that E.F. tells me just dreams or fictionist stories when he talked with me about his first contacts with the non-human being, Lacerta. I was still a skeptic when I met this being on December 16th last year, 1999, in that small warm room in the remote house of my friend near a town in the south of Sweden, despite the fact that I saw now with my own eyes that she was not human. She has told and shown me many unbelievable things during that meeting that I can't deny the reality and the truth of her words any longer. This is not another of that wrong UFO papers which claim to tell the truth, but tell in fact just fiction. I'm convinced that this transcript contains the only truth, and therefore you should read it. I had talked with her for over three hours, so the following transcript shows you only shortened parts of the interview because she asked me after the interview not to publish everything she had told me already now. The order of the questions in this transcript is not always the same order in which I had asked them, so it may seem sometimes a little bit confusing to you. It was not easy to delete all the important parts she asked me to delete from the transcript, so I apologize for the maybe unusual order. I'm in possession of the entire transcript of the interview, 49 pages, with some of my drawings of her body and her equipment, and also some tapes on which I have the full interview, but I will not reveal this before I have permission from her. I will send this shortened form of the still fascinating document to four of my reliable friends to Finland, Norway, Germany, and France, and I hope they will translate it into their own languages and into other languages, and I hope as many people as possible will be able to read and to understand the transcript. If you receive it, please send it to all your friends via email or make printouts and copy them. I certify furthermore that various paranormal abilities of her species, like telepathy and telekinesis, including the moving and dancing of my pencil on the table without touching, and the flying of an apple around 40 centimeters over her hands, were shown to me during the three hours and six minutes of the meeting, and I'm absolutely sure that these abilities were no tricks. The following is certainly difficult to understand and to believe for someone who hasn't experienced it, but I was really in contact with her mind, and I'm now completely sure that everything she said during the interview is absolutely truth about our world. Unfortunately, if I read the entire transcript and much more, this very shortened form by myself, I have the strong impression that everything I've written sounds too unbelievable to be true, that everything sounds more like a bad science fiction story from TV or cinema, and I have doubts that anyone will believe my experiences, but they are true if you believe it or not. I can't expect from you that you believe my simple words without evidence, but I can't give you that evidence. Please read the transcript and think about it, and you will maybe see the truth in these words. There will be a new meeting between me and her, again in the same house in Sweden, on April 23rd, 2000, and she promised me to give me maybe some evidence of her existence. In the meantime, I collect questions, which I will ask her then. Maybe she gives me permission to reveal more of the missing parts in that transcript and about the coming war. Believe it or not, this makes no real difference, but I hope you will believe. Ole K., January 8, 2000, transcript of interview, shortened form, December 16, 1999. Question. First of all, who are you and what are you? Are you an extraterrestrial species or can your origin be found on this planet? Answer. As you could see with your own eyes, I'm not a human being like you. And to be honest, I'm no real mammal, despite my partly mammal-like body features. 
which are a result of evolution. I am a female reptile being belonging to a very old reptile race. We are the native Terrans, and we live on the planet since millions of years. We are mentioned in your religious writings like your Christian Bible, and many of the ancient human tribes were aware of our presence and worshipped us as gods, for example the Egyptians and the Inca, and many other old tribes. Your Christian religion has misunderstood our role in your creation, so we are mentioned as evil serpent in your writings. This is wrong. Your race was genetically engineered by aliens, and we were just the more or less passive visitors of this accelerated evolution process. You must know some of your scientists have already supposed this, that your species had evolved in a naturally completely impossible speed with just two to three million years. This is absolutely impossible, because evolution is a much slower process if it's natural. But you have not understand this. Your creation was artificial and done by genetic engineering, but not by us, but by an alien species. If you ask me if I'm an extraterrestrial, I must answer no. We are native Terrans. We had and have some colonies in the solar system, but we originate on this planet. It is in fact our planet and not yours. It was never yours. Question, can you tell me your name? Answer, this is difficult because your human tongue is not able to pronounce it correctly and a mispronunciation of our names is very offensive for some of my kind. Our language is very different from yours. But my name is, I will try to say it's smoother by use of your human letters, something like Sh with a very, very strong pronunciation of the sh and the k. We have no four names like you, but only a single but unique name which is divided and characterized by the way of speaking which is given not to children who have an own children's name, but only in a special procedure in the adolescent age at time of their either religious or scientific enlightenment or awareness, as you would call it. I would appreciate it if you don't try to say my real name with your human tongue. Please call me La Certa. This is the name I generally use when I'm among humans and talk with them. Question. How old are you? Answer. We measure the time, not like you, in astronomical years and in the revolve of the Earth around the Sun, because we usually live beneath the surface of the planet. Our time measurement depends on periodically returning cycles in the Earth magnetic field. And according to this, and said with your numbers, I am today, let me calculate, 57,653 cycles old. I have reached my adult phase and my awareness 16,337 cycles ago. This is a very important date for us. According to your human time scale, I'm around 28 years old. Question, what is your task? Do you have a job like us? Answer, to say it with your words, I'm a curious student of the social behavior of your species. That's why I'm here and talk to you. That's why I have revealed my real nature to EF and now to you. And that's why I give you all that secret information and why I will try to answer all your questions on your many sheets of paper, honestly. I will see how you react, how others of your kind react. There are so many crazies and liars of your kind on this planet who claim to know the truth about us, about UFOs, about aliens, and so on. And some of you believe their lies. I'm interested to see how your species will react if you make the truth which I will tell you now, public. I'm quite sure every one of you will refuse to believe my words, but I hope I'm wrong, because you need to understand if you want to survive the coming years. Question, I've read your full statement which you have given to EF about this, but can you give me now just a short answer? Are UFOs real flying objects piloted by extraterrestrials or do they belong to your species? Answer, some observed UFOs, as you call them, belong to us, but most not. Most of the mysterious flying objects in the sky are not technological devices, but mainly misinterpretations of natural phenomena your scientists have not understand. 
like spontaneous plasma flares in the high atmosphere. Nevertheless, some UFOs are real craft, belonging either to your own species, especially to your military, or to other alien species, or at last to us, but a minority of sighted craft belongs really to us because we are generally very careful with our movements in the atmosphere, and we have special ways to hide our ships. If you read a report about a sighting of a metalish, bright gray, cigar-shaped cylindrical object with a length of, there are many different types, let me say, between 20 and 260 of your meters, and if this object made a very deep humming sound, and if there were five bright red lights on the metalish surface of the cigar, one at the top, one in the middle, two at the end, then it's likely that someone of you have seen one of our ships. And this means that it was either partly defect or someone of us was not careful enough. We have also a very small fleet of disc-shaped craft, but such UFOs belong usually to an alien species. Triangular UFOs belong generally to your own military, but they use foreign technology to build them. If you really want to try to see one of our craft, you should have a look at the skies over the Arctic, the Antarctic, and over Inner Asia, especially over the mountains there. Question, have you a special symbol or something like that with which we can identify your kind? Answer, we have two major symbols representing our species. One, the more ancient symbol, is a blue serpent with four white wings on a black background. The colors have religious meanings for us. This symbol was used from certain parts of my society, but it is today very seldom. You humans have copied it very often in your old writings. The other symbol is a mystic being you would call a dragon in the shape of a circle with seven white stars in the middle. This symbol is much more common today. If you see one of that symbols on a cylindrical craft I've described in my previous answer, or on some underground installation, this thing or place belongs definitely to us, and I would advise you to go away from there as soon as possible. Question. The seven stars in the second symbol you've mentioned, do they mean the Pleiades? Answer. Pleiades? No, actually the seven stars are planets and moons, and they are a symbol for our former seven colonies in the solar system. The stars are shown in front of a blue background, and the dragon circle means the shape of Earth. The seven white stars mean moon, Mars, Venus, and four moons of Jupiter and Saturn we had colonized in the past. Two colonies are no longer in use and abandoned. So five stars would be more correct. Question, as you have not allowed me to make photos, what would be useful to prove your real existence and the truth of this story? Can you describe yourself detailed? Answer, I know that it would be helpful to prove the authenticity of this interview if you make some photos from me. Otherwise, you humans are very skeptic. That's good for us and for the real alien species acting secretly on this planet. So even if you had such photos, many of your kind would say that they are fraud, that I'm just a masked human woman or something like that. That would be very offensive for me. You must understand that I can't give you permission to make photos of me or my equipment. This has various reasons, which I want not to discuss with you further. But one of the reasons is keeping up the secrecy of our existence. Another reason is more religious. Nevertheless, you have permission to make drawings of my look and of my equipment. I can show you later. I can also describe myself to you, but I doubt that others of your kind will be able to imagine my real look just from simple words, because the automatic denial of the existence of reptilian species and generally of intelligent species other than your own is part of the programming of your mind. Well, I will try. Imagine the body of a normal human woman and you have at first a good imagination of my body. Like you, I have a head, two arms, two hands, two legs, and two feet, and the proportions of my body are like yours. As I am female, I also have two breasts, despite our reptile origin. We have started to give milk to our babies during the evolution process. This happened around 30 million years ago, because this is the best thing to keep the young alive. Evolution has done this for your species already in the dinosaur age and a little bit later, also for ours. This means not that we are now real mammals, but the breasts of us are not as large as those of human woman, 
the size of them is generally equal for every female of my kind the external reproduction organs are for both sexes smaller than those of humans but they are visible and they have the same function as yours another gift of evolution to our species my skin is mainly of a green beige color more pale green and we have some patterns of brown irregular dots each dot the size of one to two centimeters on our skin and in our face the patterns are different for both sexes but females have more especially in the lower body and in the face you can see them in my case as two lines over the eyebrows crossing my forehead at my cheek and at my chin my eyes are a little bit larger than human eyes for this reason we can see better in the darkness and usually dominated from the large black pupils which are surrounded from a small bright green iris males have a dark green iris the pupil is slit and can change its size from a black line to a wide open egg-shaped oval because our retina is very light sensitive and the pupil must compare this we have external round ears but they are small and not so curved as yours but we can hear better because our ears are more sensitive for sonic we can also hear a wide range of sonic there is a muscle or lid over the ears which can completely close them for example under water our nose is more pointed and there is a v-shaped curving between the nostrils which enabled the ancestors to see temperature we have lost most of this ability but we can still feel temperature much better with this organ our lips are shaped like yours those of female a bit larger than those of males but of a pale brown color and our teeth are very white and strong and a little bit longer and sharper than your soft mammal teeth we have no difference hair colors like you but there is a tradition to color the hairs in different ages and the original color is like mine a greenish brown our hairs are thicker and stronger than yours and they grow very slowly in addition the head is the only part of our body where we have hairs our body arms and legs are similar in shape and size to yours but the color is different green beige like the face and there are scale like structures on the upper legs over the knee and upper arms over the elbow our five fingers are a little bit longer and thinner than human fingers and our skin on the palm is plain so we have no lines like you but again a combination of scale like skin structure and of the brown dots both sexes have the dots on the palm and we have no fingerprints like you if you touch my skin you will feel that it's smoother than your hairy skin there are small sharp horns on the inside of both middle fingers the fingernails are gray and generally longer than yours you will see that my nails are not so long and round at the top this is because i am female males have sharp pointed nails with a length of sometimes five or six of your centimeters the following feature is very different from your body and part of our reptilian origin if you touch the back side of my upper body you will feel a hard bony line through my clothing this is not my spine but a very difficult shaped external plate structure of skin and tissue following exactly our spine from the head to the hip there is an extremely high number of nerves and large blood vessels in this structure and in the plates which are around two or three centimeters long and very touch sensitive this is the reason why we have always problems to sit in chairs with a back like this chair the main task of these small plates besides a role in our sexuality is simply the regulation of our body temperature and if we sit in natural or artificial sunlight these plates become more blood filled and the vessels become wider and the sun is able to heat up our reptiloid blood which circulates through the body and through the plates for many degrees and that gives us great pleasure what else is different from your kind oh we have no navel because we were born in a different way to your mammal birth the other exterior differences from your kind are minor and i think i must not mention all now because most of them are not visible if we wear clothing i hope the description of my body was detailed enough i would advise you to make some drawings question what kind of clothing do you generally wear i suppose this is not the way you dress normally answer 
No, I wear this human everyday clothing only when I'm among humans. To be honest, it's not very comfortable for me to wear such tight things. And it's always very unusual feeling. If we are in our own home, this means in our subterranean home, or in our large artificial sun areas, and we are together with others near to our own name, we are usually naked. Is this shocking to you? When we are in the public place and together with many others of my species, we wear very wide and soft clothing made of thin light stuff. I have told you that many parts of our bodies are very touch sensitive, mostly the small back plates, so we can't feel comfortable in tight clothing because it can hurt us. Man and woman often wear the same kind of clothing, but the colors are different for the sexes. Question, you've said others near your own name. Do you mean your family? Answer, no, not really. You would call it family, but this word means only those of your kind which belong genetically together, like father or mother and child. As I have said earlier, we have a very difficult and unique name. Part of the pronunciation of that name is absolute unique, and there is no other being with the same name. But part of this name, the middle part, is pronounced in a way that told you the others to which family, I must use the word because you haven't the right one in your vocabulary, you belong. This means not that all in that group are genetically related to you because these groups are usually very large and contain between 40 and 70 of us. This group includes generally your genetic relations, except one of them had decided to leave this group, and your connection with father and mother is often the strongest. It would be too difficult for me to explain to you now our very old social system, which is very complex, and we would need many hours only for the primary teachings. Maybe we can meet another time, and I can give you detailed descriptions of all these things. Question. Have you a tail like normal reptiles? Answer. Do you see one? No, we have no visible tail. If you look at our skeleton, there are only a small rounded bone at the end of our spine behind the pelvis. This is a useless rudiment of tail of our ancestors, but it is not visible from the outside. Oh, our embryos have tails during the first months of development, but these tails disappear before they were born. A tail makes only sense for a primitive species which tries to walk on two legs and then must held the balance with the tail. But our skeleton has changed during evolution and our spine is nearly the same shape as yours. So we need no tail to stay on two feet. Question, you said you were born in a different way to us. Do you lay eggs? Answer, yes, but not like your birds or primitive reptiles. Actually, the embryo grows in a protein liquid inside the mother's womb, but there is also an egg-shaped but very thin chalk hull around it that fills the whole womb. The embryo inside this hull is completely autark from the mother's body, and it has every substance it needs to develop inside this chalk hull. There is also a cord, like your navel cord, which is connected to a point hidden behind the back plates. When the baby is going to be born, the whole egg is pressed through the vagina, covered in a slimy protein substance, and the baby came out of this soft egg after some minutes. These two horns in our middle fingers were instinctively used from babies to break through the chalk hull to take their first breath. Our young are not so large as your babies when they are born. They are between 30 and 35 of your centimeters tall. The egg is around 40 centimeters tall. This is because our vagina is smaller than a human one. But we grow to a normal size of 1.6 to 1.8 meters. Question, what about your body temperature? You said that you enjoy to lay in the sun. What effect has this to your organism? Answer, we are not mammals. And as reptiles, our body temperature depends on the temperature of our surroundings. If you touch my hand, you will maybe feel that it is colder than yours because our normal body temperature is around 30 to 33 degrees centigrade. If we sit in the sun, especially naked, and with our row of small back plates in the sun, our body temperature can rise for 8 or 9 degrees within minutes. 
This rise can cause a production of many enzymes and hormones in our body, our heart and brain and every organ becomes more active, and we feel then very, very good. You humans only enjoy to be in the sun, but for us it is the greatest pleasure you can imagine, maybe like your sexual excitement. We also enjoy to swim in very warm water or other liquids to raise our body temperature. If we are for some hours in the shadow, our temperature goes back to 30 to 33 degrees. This can cause no harm to us, but we feel much better in the sun. We have artificial sun rooms in the underground, but this is not the same for us like the real sun. Question, what do you eat? Answer, generally various things like you, flesh, fruit, vegetables, special kinds of fungus from subterranean farms, and other things. We can also eat and digest some substances which are poisonous for you. The main difference between you and us is that we must eat flesh because our body needs the proteins. We can't live completely vegetarian like your kind because our digestion would stop working and we would die after some weeks or maybe months without flesh. Many of us eat raw flesh or other things which would be disgusting to you. Personally, I prefer cooked flesh and surface fruits like apples or oranges. Question. Can you tell me something about the natural history and evolution of your species? How old is your species? Have you evolved from primitive reptiles as mankind has evolved from apes? Answer. Oh, this is a very long and complex story, and it sounds certainly unbelievable to you, but it's the truth. I will try to explain it in short. Around 65 million years ago, many of our unadvanced ancestors from the dinosaur race died in a great global cataclysm. The reason for this destruction was not a natural disaster, an asteroid impact, as your scientists believe falsely. Where do the rituals take place that you've been involved in, uh, involving the, the, the British royal family? Uh, Glamis Castle, Stonehenge, um, Balmoral Castle. Um, I have, have reason to believe there was a, there's a church, and I think it may be Westminster Abbey. Um, and... There is a, a Mothers of Darkness castle or chateau in Brussels, Belgium. They've been there too. And also in France, uh, the Marquis de Libero Pindar has a castle in the uh, Alsace-Lorraine region of France. And I believe it's in the Alsace region. Uh, that he uses and, and there are certain rituals done at that castle down in the dungeon part of that castle and there's an entrance down there to uh, underground uh, places in the earth and there is a natural uh, formation of rocks that kind of glow green and there they keep menstrual blood in that uh, formation and it this green uh, glowing from these rocks actually turns the blood a darker color and it's called black blood and it's used in certain rituals but there are also they they keep Small, there are smaller, less developed little um, reptilians that are kept down there. They're kind of pets. But one other thing that's also down there, they have, there are eggs. It's like a, a, a nest of eggs kept down in that, in that part where it's warm. It's very warm down there. In this, in into this entrance, and uh, these eggs are kept down there incubating, and they're rep, they are the reptiles' eggs, and uh, that's where they they keep them. 
What are your memories of conducting the rituals um, for the royal family? Um, what happened? What, what were they doing? Um, one thing that, that sticks out in my mind, um, it, this was before Charles was married to Diana. He was involved with Camilla Parker Bowles and she is, does not shape shift, but she became pregnant by Charles and she produced a baby um, and this baby was presented at the ritual and killed and that is the price, uh, the firstborn between these two and eventually these two will marry and that that is that is the price that is to be paid the the sacrifice of the firstborn between a union of these two people i saw a very kind of dark man that i, I that i he was arabic it seemed to be arabic or or egyptian or and i i heard the name fayed being mentioned and uh, the Queen Mother was there, and I called her the Black Queen. And she and he see, were talking very seriously and at some length about a subject. They were mentioning uh, Diana, and they were mentioning his son, Doty. And at the time, I didn't know who Dodie was. I knew who Diana was. I never saw her at any rituals. Um, Where did this conversation take place? This took place at Balmoral Castle. Um, and I heard them talking about a marriage between these two, and I thought at the time, well, she's married to... Charles. How can there be a marriage when she's married to Charles? I didn't understand why the 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 uh, Queen Mother and uh, uh, this person that I now know to be Dodi Fayed, because I heard Fayed, um, Muhammad Al Fayed, um, talking, and I'd seen them together at. Uh, I saw them at Balmoral Castle. I overheard the conversation at Balmoral, but I'd seen them also at uh, Mothers of Darkness uh, Chateau in Brussels, and they were talking about uh, a union between Diana and uh, his son Dodie back in the late 80s, and I did not understand at that time because I understood Diana to be married to Charles. I knew that she was married to Charles and they had two children. And uh, they were about to have another. Um, and uh, the Queen Mother, I picked, I, all I could pick up was that, that for some reason that there was a malevolence towards Diana, and uh, Diana I had never seen at a ritual. Um, I wondered what she knew about all of this. What have you seen um, the royal family do, the queen, the queen mother, and uh, the other people you've seen in the rituals? What, what have you seen them do? I've seen all of them drink human blood and consume human flesh and uh, they have their own um, goblets in which they have blood and these, these goblets are encrusted with jewels um, and they also have their own daggers and that, that the dagger goes into the goblet and they stir 
the blood around with it, and it, it's also a um, what it is. It's a symbol of the of the phallus going into the vagina, and when they're doing this, and um, I've seen them do this, and they some of them have even like the the uh, queen mother I saw with. She had her own um, little, I, I would like almost it's between a, a, a very elaborate ornate chair or a throne kind of thing brought in for her to sit, and um, because before these rituals actually start, um, there is a kind of uh, people um, move around the room and talk. Um, or, or recognize one another. It's a formal kind of a ritualistic setup. The way they talk and the way they they intro they're introduced they introduce each other. It's like a court. What are they wearing? They're wearing uh, robes. They're not wearing anything underneath the robes, and the robes are um, very ornate. Um, they all have, the one thing in common they have is they have a, a red color, like blood, and some of them have purple. And um, they have uh, gold uh, kinds of lines running through them. They have the, uh, the Merovingian um, symbol of France, the uh, fleur de lis. Um, and, um, there are jewels that are sewn in at certain points on these robes, and um, they wear these robes, but they don't wear anything underneath the, the robes because what is going to happen, what the rituals are all about, they're going to shape shift, and they can't have anything on under the robes, and there are there are orgy kind of things that go on at the rituals also. And, uh, involving the, the royal family of Britain? Yes, involving the royal family of Britain. Listening to what you're saying um, would obviously be staggered, I guess, anywhere in the world, but what would stagger them mostly is um, in Britain, the Queen Mother has an image of being the nation's grand grandmother, the nice old lady and uh, good old Queen Mum, what a lovely lady. What's your experience of, of the Queen Mother? She is very cold in reality and she is very cruel and she is very um, different than she comes across to the public. Um, She's cold-blooded. Um, she, if she feels that you are someone beneath her, even uh, in the Illuminati, that you're at her equal or your station is above her, she will not speak to you. She will not recognize you. Um, she obviously from what I see, enjoys consuming human flesh. Uh, it's sickening. The first one, this is a child's ring. It is a 14 carat gold white, or 14 carat white gold ring with a diamond in the middle of a hexagram, or a, he a hexagonal shape, and it forms, it looks like a hexagon if you were able to look closely at the diamond. This was returned to me by my ex-husband who told me, well, this was in your daughter's clothes. And this was a message to me. Well, any, any uh, high-ranking survivors that I have talked to that know of this ring know that it's from Mothers of Darkness. The necklace here is made out of copper and it's very Egyptian, and 
it was given to me when I turned 19, and that's an important age because you really start at the position I was at, uh, having these psychic powers in full effect and being allowed to do this in full effect during rituals, and this was worn during certain rituals. Why copper and why, why, why have it at all? Copper is a transmitter. Copper is you, has always been used in the occult. Um, I've had repeatedly had phone calls of tones coming over my phone and tones that you can't make by pressing telephone buttons, tones that sound like sonar sounds from a submarine, um, tones that sound like they were made by some type of instrument, and I have had directed energy used on me, ELF, uh, low frequency electric waves used on me, microwave energy, and this in turn created has created uh, two different, I have would hear uh, one tone in one ear, one tone in a different tone in the other ear. It creates a third tone. They're called tritones. They change the electrical activity of your brain waves and uh, to put you in the state they want you in. Thing, this is a cycle that goes on with thousands and thousands of survivors, not just myself. And this is how they perpetuate it if there is a parent that's protective that believes and has found out this is happening. Can we talk about some of the um, famous names that people around the world would know who, in your experience, have um, taken part in these rituals that you've conducted? You say you've conducted them in Europe and uh, the United States. Can we start with the United States? Uh, yes. Um, I have seen at rituals, I have seen George Bush. Um, I have seen um, Madeleine Albright. I have seen Henry Kissinger. Um, I have seen uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, and I have also, by the way, uh, seen his wife, Nancy Reagan. I have seen Hillary Clinton before I knew she was Hillary Clinton uh, at the time um, at these rituals. She is involved. Um, the other people that I have named and are as I have seen shapeshift into reptilians. Uh, I have not seen Hillary Clinton actually shapeshift, but I, she is involved. Um, I have seen the two sons when they were young, the two sons of um, of George Bush present at these rituals. Are these the sons that have become governors? Yes. One is in Florida and one is in Texas. Um, I have seen, uh, uh, did I mention J. Rockefeller? Um, and he shapeshifts. Um, I've seen George Duke Magian and uh, Ronald Reagan again, having been governor in California. Um, there have been people um, such as Newt Gingrich have, I've see, I saw, and I didn't know at the time that he was Newt Gingrich. I recognized that he was Newt Gingrich when uh, Clinton came into power and after he was, uh, Newt Gingrich was then elected Speaker of the House and I was horrified to realize that this man was also there. I'm, all of this is, has um, affected me to the point I don't vote. Um, all of these people seem to all be connected to the Illuminati. Presidents um, like um, uh, Carter and, and Ford and Clinton. And, I've seen uh, Ford there. Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, yes. Um, are, they, are they all reptilian bloodlines? I haven't seen Carter shapeshift. You've seen him at rituals, have you? Yes. Gerald Ford, I have seen shapeshift, um, and Johnson also.
Lyndon the, Johnson. Lyndon Johnson. Um, also, uh, Dr. Joseph Mengele, who took me around to these uh, rituals a lot of the time, uh, was also a shapeshifter. And uh, there were also people that I, in, there are people in, uh, in the European countries that I've seen um, shapeshift and, and be involved. And this, uh, it does not. It doesn't surprise me any more than it does the uh, the people in this country doing it. It's just for some reason more shocking, and, and it, it cuts even deeper. Um, because I've seen the Queen Mother there, and I have seen uh, um, the Queen there. I've seen uh, Princess Margaret there. I've seen Charles there, um, and they shape shift. And I have seen um, this. I and I'm not. I'm not coming up with his name right now. But he was president in France after De Gaulle. He was there. I've seen him there. Um, I've seen uh, the Rothschilds there. I used to see uh, the Rothschild that lived in England there, but the one that still goes there and is a shapeshifter, Guy de Rothschild, Baron Guy de Rothschild, uh, has been to all of these rituals and has been over in this country under the name of Dr. Barrington. Uh, I have seen Tony Blair there, um, and he shapeshifts. Um, I have seen Prince Philip there. Um, they all have their quirks um, as, how, as to how they act, even as, in their reptilian form. Um, and they all, I mean, they, they act, they don't act all like robots, but they, they have their quirks, they have their, their, uh, uh, so-called personalities, but they are all cold-blooded. Uh, they would kill at the drop of a hat. Um, it, it, part of it was about uh, the minstrel blood, and what really triggered me was when he ca called it Starfire, because that is one of that is the name of one of the aspects of the three uh, women who are are the, mo the dressed mother goddess that is my name in, in all of this. Um, so this man I have seen, he has lots of power in, within this uh, sect of uh, reptilians, um, and he's someone that is, you, would wa you would want to watch out for um, out outside of this, too, um, as is this Sitchin person. Um, what do you remember about uh, Zachariah Sitchin? Zachariah Sitchin was someone in the rituals who are in attending the rituals who was not a major player in, in as far as the rituals went, but was someone that, that others present did not make remarks at or were very careful as to what they said around him. And um, he was talking about, he would be talking about um, doing away with people, uh, persons that, that were in his way or were not, were putting out information that, that he didn't feel that he wanted put out. Um, he, he is very much a disinformer, um, and that is his job. 
to disinform about what is going on with the Illuminati and with the reptilians. He actually warned me off from investigating the reptilians, interestingly. People would also look at the Queen Mother's um, elderly, frail stature and uh, find it very difficult to see uh, her taking part in rituals and doing anything, if you like, active. Um, do they go into a different state um, uh, in terms of age and strength and, and all these other attributes when they actually shapeshift? Yes, uh, the, the human body that they, that they choose to occupy or take when it was young, it ages, but when they take the reptilian form, they still, these reptilians live hundreds of years, and so they have to have taken more than one human body to live in. Uh, there, a lot of them are much, much older, and I'm including the Queen Mother in this, and older than, than people think that that she is. She's been in more than one body, human form. And when the time comes, if it is time for her to go on, it has been chosen that she still has, I mean, it's known that she still has life or years to go, again, she will be put into the body, the essence of her, and the reptilian form will go or the essence of her will go into another body that is also has the ability to shape shift into reptilian form. One of the one of the pure reptilian human bloodlines. Yes. What happens when take the Queen Mother as, as an example, what happens when they shape shift? I mean, what do you see? Uh, you start to see changes happen and they're happening so fast. Uh, that it's almost, it, it's, it's the closest thing that I, I've seen to it is uh, what they're now doing with computer technology. It just, it, it's just a, a literal transformation that happens very quickly. And they get taller and they get bigger and um, they're, they don't look at all as, as reptilians like they do as humans. Um, and thus, the wearing of the robes, because if they were in clothes, the clothes would be torn apart. So, so let's take the Queen Mother on this subject as an example. We recognize her as a frail old lady. Um, what does she look like when she shapeshifts at these rituals? She has, uh, she looks like she, she, the nose portion gets very much longer and it grows into kind of a snout kind of thing. She has little fangs um, and, and incisors as, as teeth and there's a tongue. They all seem to have this kind of tongue uh, when they're in, in at this level. The tongue has a lot of long uh, hairy or pointed projection, projections coming out of it. It's very long and um, they have these, they don't have hands or feet, they have these, these claws. Um, and they have um, scales and, the, and also scales that seem to kind of disappear into one another. Um, but it, it's, it's more um, um, pronounced on the back. There seem to be lumps or protrusions coming from the head. Um, there seem to be some kind of, of growth uh, appendages at where, you know, on the back. And I, they, they seem folded. And not all of them have that. Um, and there is a tail, and they, a lot of times, will keep the tail curled. And when, the, when I mean, when, and I've seen her when she's very uh, displeased with something, as I've seen other members like this, 
uh, this tail is whipped around, uh, very agitated, and they do, and she and she hisses. What 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 color are they? Um, which one in particular? The, the, take, take the Queen Mother as an example. She's um, kind of a beige color on the underside, and by the time you're going up around to the back and in the tail and the top of the head and, and on top of the the nose, snout, whatever, it, it's coming to a very uh, there are dark speckles of or large speckles of dark browns, and um, the eyes usually they're very they're large they look like they're very round and they look like they're coming out of their sockets and um, very protruding and uh, usually the color ranges um, from a beige to a gold to a dark greenish gold and then there's this dark slit up and down uh, a vertical slit and um, when and, and the eyes will look hooded um, and when they look hooded it's a very frightening thing because it seems that when the eyes are hooded uh, they're about to do something what do you mean by hooded the, the lids come down and they it, like there, it's almost, I guess it would be the same thing in a human as an expression of, of it's someone's got an idea. And how tall are they when, when they shapeshift? They're about, just about seven feet tall. Um, some, are, some are a little shorter um, or to a foot shorter. Uh, some are a little bit taller than seven feet. So what what would the Queen and Prince Charles look like in their reptilian form? As to height? As to general appearance? They're, they, well, Charles resembles, um, <laughs> Charles resembles uh, in both ways, in human form and in, uh, in reptilian, re he resembles Pindar. He's shorter, though, in, in reptilian form than Pindar. But he, then, the, the way that the, uh, the reptilian, the, the nose shapes into the snout at that point, and the jaw becomes the under part, um, it, it, it's very, um, much like Pindar, and his mother doesn't um, look quite the same as he does. Um, but what does the queen look like? The queen, she's she's uh, darker, um, not quite so pale. She's darker. Um, all over, she doesn't have the amount of, of I, I would call it freckling. Um, it's more like a gradual, uh, like the skin is gradually getting darker. It's more smooth. And she does have the lumps up on, the, around her head and down the tail, the spine. Charles has the, the the tails from down around the spine, and funny enough, he has the uh, the uh, protrusions from the skull in the in the reptilian form, where about or above, right above where it seems like his ears would have been. What um, what is it about the rituals that allow the shape shifting to happen? Um, when they when they, the victims are starting to be sacrificed, it's the scent of the blood. And they start shape-shifting at that point in time. And they can hardly wait to get to the blood. There's, it's, it's like it, they're addicted to the, to the blood. 
and um, then the consumption of human flesh that follows. What have you seen the Queen um, or any of the royal family do in relation to that? You've seen them, have you seen them sacrifice and, and, uh, and uh, consume human flesh? There are certain times when they will actually do a sacrifice or there will have been someone doing a sacrifice and it's not happening fast enough for them. So they will step in and finish it themselves because it, the sacrifice has, the ritual has to be gone through. The, it's sacrificially, I mean ritualistically, it has to have been gone through and they will step right in and just start tearing this this th the throat out and um, they're getting all this blood from the jugular vein at the same time and that has happened when they when there are many there that are going to be sacrificed and they just can't wait and then tearing into um, the contents of, of the uh, abdomen and stomach of a victim afterwards. And Who have you seen do that? I've seen uh, the Queen Mother do that and Prince Philip and Charles. Um, I've seen um, a Guy de Ross child do this. Um, it seems that I've seen it more among royalty or so-called so royalty do this than people that are, are not titled, that they don't seem to, they seem like, they, it feels like they don't dare, but they, they, they shapeshift nonetheless, but it's like the royals that step in and just start tearing away because they can hardly wait. How long can they hold the reptilian form in these occasions? In during the rituals, it's much easier for them to hold the reptilian form. They can stay in that form. What is the, what what it is is that they can they have a hard time holding their human form. And uh, as long as they're around blood and the scent of blood, they can't hold a human form in terms of the ritual that you, you know about and the royal family background that you know about. What was, what was all that about? What happened in Paris? Diana was a ritual sacrifice because she's named after goddess Diana. She was chosen from before birth for the purpose of which she served. I understand and very well and I'm very empathetic uh, towards Diana because in a way it parallels what happened to me to have served your purpose, had two children and then be thrown, tossed aside. And um, to her horror though, she obviously never attending a ritual, she <laughs> knew something was happening and uh, she knew what was going on and could not be trusted to be at a ritual anyways. I, and I don't think that Diana would have attended a ritual. Um, I don't think that, that they could get her to cooperate in, the, in this app because she actually saw for herself that this was going on after she married Charles. Um, was there any way, um, when Diana was married to Charles, without attending a blood ritual, that she could have seen him or one of the others become a reptile? They have a tendency when they're asleep uh, to shapeshift and not, they have, they have to consciously hold their form and when they're asleep um, they have a tendency to not hold human form and to shapeshift uh, into reptilians and um, there could be other things that happen, you know, I'm thinking about the times that Diana would have, would have gone through a menstrual period, well that would have uh, also uh, really 
triggered some of these people in the royal family that are reptilian around her to want to shape shift or any any woman any human woman in in that household that would be having a period would tend that scent of blood would tend to uh, cause a momentary shape shift what was the whole um, what appears to be a ceremony um, surrounding her assassination what was that about um, the the rumors that she was pregnant um, the Egyptian Dodi fired um, and the place where uh, it all happened which is an ancient sacrificial site to the goddess Diana um, how does all that fit together in the rituals that you know about um, okay the 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 crown aspect of the goddess is uh, Hecate and the day of Hecate is on August 13th and what what is very prevalent in in uh, this with with the Illuminati and what they've done with the Druidism and other and, and Egypt the Egyptian religions is they like to mirror the numbers and so as as like for example with the goddess Isis her number is 18 uh, when you mirror it it's 81 and that is that is the uh, um, number of the sister of Isis Nephthys and Nephthys uh, was considered the evil sister to Isis um, with Hecate what what I think happened here is that she was sacrificed and it was a very important sacrifice because uh, three people died and it was a it was a picture of the triad of Isis Osiris and Horus to them Horus being the unborn child of Dodi Fayed that Diana carried and was three months old which is another very important fact a number that's important to them to be three months old uh, sacrificial babies are taken in utero at three five and seven months and um, when I when I heard about this this was a deal that I understood now had gone down and um, she had to die in that tunnel because that tunnel is the passageway for Diana the goddess and um, she died at the 13th pillar again because of Hecate and uh, she died on the 31st because it's the mirror image of 13 and um, my my understanding of, of what I get inside of me and because I was told by Baron Guy de Rothschild last beginning of February when he was in this country and he was uh, there to re try and reprogram me again and impregnate me was that he was in the tunnel that night he had to be there because not only was it a ritual death of Diana this was also about taking her soul and he was taking the soul of Diana which no one else there could do whoever was present there could not do it he could do it and he was in France this is the hypnotic stare you talk about yes and drawing in the breath and um, he had to be there to do this ritual killing this ritual murder this would mean that the ambulance team and uh, a doctor that arrived within a minute of the crash coming the other way um, must have been in on this whole deal um, or at least the people in charge of the ambulance team um, from your experience of the kind of people involved in this 
Illuminati satanic network. Uh, do you think that's possible, that, that they could set that up? Yes, I do. Uh, I've seen a lot of things set up uh, that if you did not know, if you weren't in on the so-called inner circle, or know what, what the Illuminati can do because they depend on people not believing they're really there, you would not, uh, you would have a hard time believing it. Hey.